you're not subscribed to this channel, please make sure to subscribe and set your notifications to all, so that you won't miss any new content. Every Sunday on LinkedIn, see a new 2-minute lessons release. Welcome to another episode of Global Topic. Today's topic will be Bridge Coatings Programs. Joining me today is Tony Serdanis from Gannett Fleming. He's the National Coatings Director for the firm. Tony, welcome. Hi, Jim, and thanks for having me. No problem. Hey, Tony, if you wanted to describe or go through the, uh, what the firm does, what Gannett Fleming does, and then also cover your role and responsibilities uh, with the firm and also uh, your involvement in the industry, protective coatings industry. Sure. Well, Gannett Fleming is a firm of about 2,600 employees, 65 offices throughout the United States and Canada. We're an ISO 9001 certified firm. We're SSPC QP5 certified firm. We provide design services, specification development. We have full-time nascent SSPC inspectors and staff. Um, we provide failure investigations. Uh, we are also an SSPC licensed uh, firm that provides training like SSPC, uh, C3, C5, and other courses as well. And we also can tailor an in-house uh, course for various owners, clients, private and uh, government clients as well. Uh, for myself, as you stated, I'm the National Coatings Director uh, for Gannett Fleming. My responsibility is to develop um, and go after contracts throughout the country and including Canada, uh, specifically and mostly for the bridge industry. We also do other uh, things as well, maritime, uh, tanks, uh, pipelines, but the uh, national goal is to uh, develop our bridge market, working for DOTs, uh, both state, federal government, private industries, and again, also uh, internationally uh, in Canada. Me personally, I've been in this business for uh, over 35 years, started out in the family business uh, where we cleaned and painted bridges in the uh, state of Maryland, uh, then moved up to becoming an inspector for Mid-Atlantic uh, states. I am a protective coating specialist through SSPC, NACE Level 3 certified, coating inspector certified. Um, I also have a SSPC Bridge Coating Inspector Level 1, and um, I'm also the chairman of the Bridge Coating Advisory Committee for SSPC, and I sit on, I'm also on the advisory committee for the PCCP program as well. Well, what and, a great, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 and other than that, uh, you know, I, I love the industry, I, I'm, I, I love going out and talking to owners and, and, and trying to... Um, develop a, a, a great uh, relationship with them and discuss um, bridges and, and how to go about them and, and the importance of having a good program. What a, what a great story. Uh, you, you know, we're, you know, you, you encounter people in different industries where, you know, you kind of grew up in the industry and you're an example of that, you know, still as a very young man, you've still got a long ways to go in this industry, <laughs> but, uh, Great contribution and also uh, your backgrounds, very impressive. So, Tony, let me open up this discussion. You know, each year the Federal Highway Administration, they release an updated structural deficiency, you know, bridges by highway systems report. And for those viewers who might have little or no knowledge about the current overall condition of bridges in, in America, can you put into perspective the challenges that are facing us related to our bridges? Well, it is a large challenge. We have so much infrastructure throughout this country that it's, uh, it's a challenge to maintain them, but it's also a budgetary challenge. Just to give you some information, um, a few years ago, Federal Highway came out with some information. There's a total of 600, over 600,000 bridges in the U.S. 200,000 of them are steel and over 300,000 of them are concrete. Um, the annual cost to... to the, you know, protect these uh, structures from corrosion is about $30 billion. It's, it's pretty amazing. When I saw this, it, it kind of blew my mind, at, you know, with respects as well, because we see it, you know, project specific, state specific, so you don't see the whole thing. But when I saw that $30 billion, it was pretty amazing. Um, and of course, 
what's the goal here? The primary goal is to reduce corrosion in our industry and on bridge structures. FHWA and other agencies are, and the key word here is they're looking for that 100-year life. Everybody you talk to in the industry is talking about 100-year life and how can we achieve that. And, uh, and that's where a good bridge painting program comes into play uh, to be able to achieve that, you know, through full removal, maintenance coatings, um, and those type of things. Uh, the current expectation for bridges, life bridges, is about 30 years. And, and that's with a, a good solid system, surface preparation, good specs, and, you know, all those things, all those things come into play, right? Um, maintenance is about 17, 20 years. Now, when I say 30 years, let me step back. 30 years is for a brand new structure that was cleaned and shop painted, and then the additional coatings were applied out in the field. For maintenance rehabilitation, you're looking at about 17 to 20, maybe even 25 years. It just depends on the location of the structure, the environmental impact on that structure will determine. And of course, the level of cleanliness that they use for the maintenance uh, of their structures for each individual owner. Uh, re removal and replacement for maintenance on average throughout the country, again, this is through federal highway information, has been about 12 to $15 a square foot. Now that again is the average, your simple overpasses. Anything smaller, maybe less, and again, your large structures that are over bays or you know, that could be two to three, up to five miles long in, in length of a structure, they could go as high as $25, $27 a square foot. Again, it depends on the location. If it's in downtown New York or out in the middle of nowhere in Illinois or Montana or Nebraska, you know, and again, cost of living is a factor in all those as well. Um, you know, they, they've also uh, looked into various states and what, you know, what their thoughts were. And for instance, New York State DOT, they expect to repaint their bridges every 12 years. Minnesota, they're looking at about every 18 years. And then they, they went and talked to several consultants throughout the country. And the expected or assumption, assumpted life is, is about 20 years life service which is, again, normal when you're talking about rehabilitation, total removal of the structure of, of the existing coating system and applying a new what they call the Cadillac system, which is an organic zinc epoxy urethane coating system. So, you know, when it comes to maintenance painting and, and recoding the bridges, you know, how can states and highway systems best evaluate, determine, and plan bridge coating projects? Well, I mean, of course, there's many different factors that are involved with that. Uh, but uh, initially, you, you got to figure out what your inventory is. You got to get a control of how many structures do you own as a state agency or even private agency, right? And um, there's two types of assessment or inventory of those assets or structures. One could be a, a executive survey, which is basically a visual survey of all your assets, just to get an idea visually of what condition they're in. Now, this isn't hands-on or any destructive or, or any type of testing. It's a visual um, evaluation. It's, as I said, down and dirty, gives you a quick idea of where you are, each structure. And then from that point, you can go into a more detailed um, survey. Now, what I mean by that is, let's say you have 100 bridges in your inventory and 10 of them, 20 of them are in great shape, you know that they're, they don't need anything. And the other 20 or 30 are in such bad condition, you don't need to do any physical testing. You know that those bridges are going to require total removal because the corrosion maybe is more than 20, 30, 40%. It's the ones that are in between that may have isolated uh, corrosion, at maybe even less than uh, 20%. Those are the ones you need to go out there and do a detailed survey on, um, which basically consists of going out there, film, taking film thicknesses, um, taking samples of the coatings, and determining uh, if it needs to be a total removal at that point or zone painting uh, or spot painting. I always tell owners I don't recommend spot painting because it's hard to control that. Uh, and they should really define it into a total removal or specific zones of the structure that need to be addressed that'll continue 
and extend that life of the entire bridge before they have to either repaint it totally or maybe even replace it. And, um, you know, when you, and when, when you get on, when you uh, determine that, then you can develop your needs, you know, and based on that list, you can say, you know, we need to do these structures from, you know, within three to five years. We need to do structures between five and 10 years and then uh, other structures that can go out 10 plus years you know, because they're in great shape. It, again, it just depends on the level of corrosion and deterioration of that coating system on their structures and where they're located. And then when you, want it, when you develop and you got there and do that field investigation to really get a good idea and a handle of what each of those questionable bridges are, right? Then you want to do that detailed field investigation. And again, like I've stated just a minute ago, you know, is corrosion, you want to detail it. if corrosion is scattered or isolated, what's the adhesion of that existing coating system, not only to the substrate, but within itself, you know, is the top coat adhered properly to the intermediate, is the intermediate adhered properly to the primer and then primer to the substrate, what's the adhesion value of that system to the substrate and within itself will determine, you know, can you do an overcoating or do you need to do a full removal? Chalking of the coating system, you know, is there, how much chalking is, um, has, you know, been going on on that system and how you need to address that as well. The brittleness of the coating. I've had experience where an owner has told me that um, these six structures that they wanted me to go out and see years ago were in great shape and visually they were. But when you got out there and started touching the structure, the paint fell off like, you know, nobody's business. So even though visually it looked good, um, it had some corrosion, but the paint was brittle and you couldn't do anything but do a total removal. And then you also have to consider film thickness. You know, how thick is the coating system? Now, SSPC has developed a guide um, that gives you some of these parameters. And if it's over 20 mils, you have to do certain things. If it's under 20 mils, you can do other things. So you need to incorporate and have an idea of what the total coating thickness is of that, of that system. Not, not just the total, but even individual thicknesses of if it's a multi-coat system that was applied to that, that structure. And then you want to identify the coating just in case you can do an, an overcoat. Is it an alkyd? Is it an epoxy? Is it a vinyl? Because there are certain overcoat systems that will work on certain existing coating systems. And you want to be careful that you choose the right overcoating system for the existing coating. Because if you don't, you can create actually a, a, a worse situation. That new system that you've applied to that existing coating system can actually pull off the original system. And so that's why you want to make sure that you use the proper overcoating if that's an option um, you know, to do. And then you want to check heavy metals. We're all concerned about that, right? Protection of the environment, protection of the workers, protection of vehicular traffic and pedestrians. So you want to you want to sample that existing system to see, you know, what's in there. Is there lead, cadmium, chromium? And then, of course, if there is, and, and typically in bridges that are 30 plus years, you're going to find those heavy metals or that, you know, that, um, you know, the lead uh, paint in there. So you want to, again, you're going to have to address that with your specification and your environmental requirements. And then you also want to look at your surrounding environments. You know, are, you know, is there a lot of humidity? Is, is that um, structure located near a plant, a chemical plant, a coal plant? that could play um, into developing a proper specification because you, you also have to take those environmental um, issues into, you know, building or developing that specification. And then once you've done all that, uh, then you can take those assets and you can go ahead and, and group them into total removal, replacement, overcoating, zone painting, or what I call do nothing. It might be in great shape. You don't have to do anything. Don't spend money um, unnecessarily use it for other programs. And then once you get all that, then you have to take other considerations into, uh, into that program, you know, your budget, you know, all States are now having, are struggling with budgets, especially with what we're going through presently with the virus, uh, taxes, tax revenues have gone down, toll revenues have gone down. So you got to look into that and see how you can use your budget wisely and most effectively. 
And then, you know, the life cycle, I mean, I'm sorry, the life expectancy of a, of a structure. If you're going to replace that structure in 10 to 15 years, maybe you want to do cosmetic repairs. Or if it's going to last longer than, you know, 20, 25, 30, 50, or that 100 year, right? Um, you may want to, then you, you have to consider total removal or zone painting to keep that uh, uh, structure in good condition so you don't have to replace it sooner than needed. And then uh, also considerations, vehicular traffic. When you're developing those specifications, do you, um, can you close that structure down completely? If, if you can allow a contractor full access to a bridge 24 hours, seven days a week, you, they're gonna, their bid prices are gonna come down versus having to set up and tear down your um, you know, maintenance of traffic every day move, you know, demob and mob your equipment every day. Those are cost factors to consider. So when I talk to clients, I always try to tell them if you can, it's hard, of course, but if you can fully close down a structure, you'll get it done quicker, number one, and the cost should go down considerably. Um, and then you want to develop your engineer's estimate and, and those type of things. Um, and then when it comes to specification development, again, once you've gathered all that information, then you want to develop the surface preparation. What surface preparation will you need in order to achieve the goals that you want for that stru specific structure? And then the coding application. And then I talk to owners, a lot of owners don't do this, but I'd say maybe it's 50-50, stripe coding. Stripe coding is so important to not just bridges, to any structures. Because a lot of people don't realize, a lot of owners don't realize uh, because they're not paint people, which is understandable, mostly you're dealing with engineers, is um, stripe coating is important for the edges, the sharp edges, bolts and all that, because um, paint tends to flow away from those areas. So stripe coating adds an extra layer of insurance, what I call. So they, you know, I ask them to consider stripe coating if they haven't already had that in their um, specification. And then as stated earlier, environmental requirements, even if you don't have lead, Containments are here to stay. So you need to you know, contain the structure with or without hazardous materials to protect the environment. You don't want dust or debris to fall into a stream or onto a roadway. Um, you want to work, protect your workers, again, uh, that are working outside of that containment system and the ones inside. So you need to make sure you apply the, the proper federal, state, and local requirements, OSHA requirements that are um, required for that um, region, that state, that municipality. You want to make sure those are listed as well. And then um, special provision. This is where I think a lot of times specifications are lacking. Um, you, a lot of times it's not a, a, a one spec covers all structures. You want to make sure that you identify unique situations, hard to reach inaccessible areas. You want to consider utilities, railroads, those can play a big factor because if you don't do that, it could cost, um, it, a contractor could come back and require extra funding or submit a claim for those type of areas. So you want to address those in advance so that everybody knows what that structure has, what issues may be occurring, and uh, when they bid on it, they're locked into that and they can't come back for the most part and ask for additional funding. Um, you know, and then you want to also include, most states do this, SSPC and NACE both have pre-qualifications for contractors. A lot of states, because of government regulations, you can only, it's only low bid. So, you know, they can't pre-qualify contractors, but I try to talk to them about adding that verbiage like SSPC has QP1 and QP2. And to add that in there, so they technically don't have to pre-qualify them, but that verbiage in their specification, in a sense, kind of allows, it gives them the opportunity through SSPC or NACE to have already those contractors pre-qualified. Um, you know, an owner has asked me years ago, well, does that guarantee me the perfect job? I tell them, no, it doesn't guarantee you the perfect job, but it lends that you'll get a better job and you could get a very good job it, because you already know you have a contractor that has met the rigid criteria based on SSPCs and NACE's requirement for that pre-qualification. They've already been vetted in a sense 
before they've, um, you know, they've applied or, or submitted for that, um, you know, contract. And uh, also to include mandatory pre, uh, uh, pre-meetings, uh, pre-bid meetings. There's only a few states and counties that I know of that require that. Most states don't. And I think that's important, too, to have them come in, ask questions, and even visit the site so there's no, quote-unquote, surprises. So th- those are the things um, that are, are important in, in developing this program. And then with submittals, contractors have to submit their um, containment plans, uh, environmental plans, uh, material plans, and um, worker protection, disposal. Those are important, especially with the containment plan. You want to make sure that that containment plan is stamped by a licensed PE in the state that the contractor is working in and that project is being done in. So those are important. They're all part of it. You know, it, it's kind of like um, uh, in real estate. You know, they talk about the three important things, location, location, location. In our industry, it's qualified contractor, great specification, and, 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 and good inspection. If you have those three things, you're going to have a successful project. You know, it's, of course, not that it's a little more complicated, not that simple, but it really is if, if, you, if you put all those three ingredients together. Um, and then when it comes to, oh, and going back to materials, a lot of owners I've noticed only ask for paints materials because they want to make sure it meets their uh, um, approved list of manufacturers and the pu- approved list of systems, right? But abrasives and solvents are just as important because, again, most owners require a, um, especially for surface preparation, surface profile range of, could be one to four mils. Well, the type of abrasive you um, include or use will determine that uh, profile. So it's a good idea to require that as well. So the owners and third-party inspection or in-house inspection knows that this is the, this is the abrasive that they're going to use. And this is what that abrasive per the product data sheet should achieve. So those are important too as well. And kind of summarizing this, you, you know, you also talking about inspectors, you also want to have good well-trained, certified, and experienced inspectors. Both organizations that I've dealt with for years, SSPC and NACE, provide those trainings. I know there's other ones out there, but those are the main ones that are required and that are usually in specifications. So you want to have a well-trained, certified inspector who knows what they're looking at, who knows what they're doing, and knows the required hold points of that specification. Um, And if Owners use um, third-party inspection like consultants. You want to make sure those consultants are, are those consultants are know what they're doing, and there are programs out there again like SSPC with their QP5 certification that again that vets pre-vets that um, consultant, so the owner knows. Okay, they have management in place. They have they have an organized. They have a, a approach in place, and they know what they're doing. And then you also um, this is a big thing too. In that specification, owners should define the authority of that inspector, be it their own inspector in-house or, again, third-party type inspections. So the owner, the contractor, and that inspector knows where they stand and what their authority is. That's actually very important as well. And, again, as we talked about, having you know, certified contractors and, and consultants. And really to tie it all in, is maintenance when it's all said and done. Contract, you know, the job's over, great job, beautiful looking structure, right? What do we do to extend the life of that so we don't have to keep coming back? Owners may want to think about bridge washing, right? In, in, in areas where they have a lot of spray during the winter and if they're using a lot of salts to melt the uh, road, you know, the, the snow on the roads, they might want to um, wash their bridges. They might want to clean out their drainage systems, Clear them out. The, the joints, the decks are in good conditions because if you have a poor joint or if the drainage system is clogged, what happens? Those, um, um, you know, the salts, the debris flow out of those and land on the beam ends and bearings, and that's they accelerate, actually, the corrosion in those areas. So, you know, all those are important, and if you pull them together, I, f- I think uh, owners will have a, a, a good program in place. 
Tony, I appreciate you going through that very comprehensive. Uh, the one thing I picked out of this is that, you know, you can have the greatest specification under, you know, on the earth, but it doesn't mean anything if you're not have, if you don't have a bridge coatings program in place, you know, going out, doing the assessment, doing, like you said, maybe some of the uh, high critical areas, doing the bridge cleaning, um, you know, checking out the maintenance issues and things like that, uh, considering um, the, the stripe coating and other type of uh, services that you might want to throw at certain bridges because as as you know and, and most people watching this uh, this episode is that when a bridge uh, is taken basically offline because of uh, deficiency related to safety because of corrosion um, it can cause a lot of hassles and a lot of headaches for people and and it, and it can cause a, cause a state to have a lot of um, uh, budget funding that's uh, lost or they have a challenge trying to manage a different program so I do like the bridge cuttings program concept uh, where it can really kind of help them plan because you know you can't do projects if you don't know what you're you know what you're facing and everything like that so you know those states tony um who you know and highway systems that use a bridge coatings program can, can you give any examples of some of the results that they've seen uh, related to you know the long-term advantages of having a program versus not having a program in place sure well the the <laughs> The bottom line is the long-term advantage of having a program in place is funding, right? You don't have to worry about, there's no surprises there. If you have a, if you have a, a good control over your assets and, and know where each bridge structure is from a corrosion standpoint, you can take a great, uh, you, you know the budget's required every year, year in, year out. There's no surprises. So from a budgetary standpoint, there's a lot of savings in that. And you can put that money towards other, you know, projects and other funding that is necessary. Um, you know, having a good inventory and understanding each bridge. Again, no surprises. You have a, you're, you're in control. The bridges aren't controlling you in a sense, right? You're in control of, of, of the needs of your structures throughout that. And you can adjust and schedule accordingly um, how they need to be done and when they need to be done. Uh, the ones that don't have those, it's going to be a surprise. They're you know, one minute they they think they have a budget in place for all their projects and they find a bridge that needs a total removal that could cost $10, $20 million. And for a smaller agency, that could be 50, 70% of their budget. And now they, you know, they're not sure how they can handle that. And, you know, and, and like you said, it could cause issues down the road. So having a program in place, really the bottom line is, is having control and having a, a, a very detailed understanding of your assets and what needs to be done year in and year out versus, you know, uh, it's a crapshoot. <laughs> Whatever comes up that year, God bless. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Tony, this has been a very, uh, very good conversation. Um, in, you know, closing out this episode, is there anything that we did not talk about that you would want to leave with the viewers? No, I, I, th I think um, we pretty much covered everything. And, and like I said earlier about location, 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 right? Um, you know, if, if, if an agency, again, be it state, I mean, government, uh, private, whatever, if they have a good bridge painting program in place, a well-written, tailored specification, and uh, properly trained inspectors, you know, you're, you're going to have a great plan. You're not going to have any worries about or surprise about what's going to come around the corner. And you'll be able to control, again, like I said, your your inventory and your budget and how you're going to proceed year in and year out interesting very good very good for uh anyone who's interested in uh reaching out to tony and talking to tony about bridge coding programs and any other uh, related topics um, i will have his uh, contact information also have a link to gannett fleming's uh, website uh, to get additional information on the firm tony i want to thank you for having the uh, opportunity to talk with you today Jim, thank you very much as well for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, have a great day. You too. Take care. So, Joe, for you know, the lay person who's watching this episode who might only think that corrosion engineering...